Good afternoon. Um, so today I want to bring up one particular Bible verse and then we're just going to elaborate on it a little bit. So everybody knows John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Hallelujah. However, I do want to emphasize that even the demons believe and tremble. So it's not enough to just believe that God is God. It's not enough to just believe that Jesus is God manifested in flesh and that he walked among us on the earth. Because if you truly believe that your life, how you carry yourself, the way you live out your life on the earth is going to reflect what you truly believe. If you believe that Jesus is God clothed in flesh and that he died on a cross for you, he poured out his blood for you, he stood in your place, he took the punishment that you deserved, he took the wrath upon himself that was meant for you, he atoned for all of your sin, past, present, and future, what you have committed and what you would commit. However, and yes, we are saved by God's grace through faith. Right? We're saved by God's grace through faith and no works of our own, lest any man can boast. And I know people love that particular verse. But some people are using God's grace and treating it as a common thing. They're using God's grace to excuse them from living any kind of way they want to live. God's grace does not excuse you to live any kind of way that you want to live. God's grace actually enables you to be a new creation. I'm going to say that again. God's grace, what we're saved by through our faith. And our faith was a gift from God. This is why we can't boast. And the only thing that we should be boasting on is the finished work of the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But God's grace enables and equips us to live consecrated and holy lives, which is what we're called to do. We are called to be set apart. We are of, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. See, when we are born again, we, we actually do become a new creation. That's just not something pretty that we say. We actually do become born again. We actually become a new creation. The gospel is repent and believe. It's not just believe. It's not just say the sinner's prayer and you are saved. You are not saved by default. You are not a Christian just because your parents were Christian. You are not a Christian because you, you went to a Christian church growing up. You are not a Christian because your father or mother was a, a, a pastor or a first lady. We're not Christian by default. To be Christian means to be Christ-like. It is a lifestyle. And what does the Bible say? We're going to go through that. Yes, we are saved by grace through no works of our own, lest any man could boast. And we don't brag unless it's in the cross of Christ, the finished work of Jesus Christ. Yes, our sins are atoned for past, present, and future. But that is not an excuse to go ahead and live like the devil or support the devil's agenda on the earth and just think that greasy grace is going to cover it up. That's not how it works. I'm not saying that you are you are to be perfect. You're not to be perfect, but you are to be growing in the faith. You are to have a relationship with him. Jesus Christ said, apart from me, you can't do anything. He mentioned apart from me, you can't bear any fruit at all. The Bible also goes on to tell us that fruitless trees will be cut at the root and cast into the fire. Fruitless trees will be cut at the root and cast into the fire. And you better believe that the ax is literally laid to the tree right now where that is concerned. You need to be bearing fruit worthy of repentance. What does it mean to bear fruit worthy of repentance? We're told what the fruits of the spirit are in Ephesians. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, 
goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You should be seeing progressive and varying degrees of more and more of what I just mentioned being evident in your life, evident when you interact with your family members, your friends, your co-workers, strangers on the street, more love, more joy in your life. He promises us joy for mourning. He promises us joy unspeakable. He promises us life and life more abundantly. He promises us all of these things and the fruits of his spirit. The Bible says you will know them by their fruit. I will tell you right now that if somebody says to me, I'm a Christian and they have no love in their heart. And everything that comes out of their mouth is nothing but bitterness and cursing. I'm going to tell you, no, you don't know the Jesus that I know. Because if you did, he would start to clear that venom right out of your heart. See, our hearts need to be circumcised. And it's a circumcision not done with human hands. It's like a spiritual surgery. How does this spiritual surgery happen? It happens in a relationship with the Lord. It happens... With in a relationship with Jesus Christ. What does the Bible tell us to do? It says, meditate on my word day and night. When is the last time you read your Bible? Or is it collecting dust? When is the last time you got into the scripture, meditated on it day and night? And the Bible also tells us not to just be hearers of the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Praise the Lord for that. But it's not enough just to have faith, right? Faith Faith without works is dead. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, but faith without works is dead. Now you have to actually take what you read and apply it, put it into practice. If I read that gossip is wrong in the Bible and that God hates it, then the next time that I'm in the break room, or the lunchroom, the cafeteria, or wherever people are congregating and speaking about people who are not physically present and trashing their character and cursing and slandering their name. I'm going to extricate myself. I'm going to remove myself from that conversation because I know what God's word says. So he says, meditate on my word day and night. Why? The, um, the prayer where it says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then it says, Give us today our daily bread. Our daily bread. God's word is your daily bread. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the word made flesh. Why do we need daily bread? Because what I need today is going to be different from what I need tomorrow. What I need tomorrow is going to be different from what I needed last week. That's why you're supposed to be in there every day. It's because Jesus is the word made flesh. And the Bible is alive and active and sharper than a double-edged sword. Why does it say the Bible is alive and active? Because Jesus is alive. He is risen. He is the only God throughout history that died and got back up, died and rose again. And he is at the right hand of the Father right now interceding for you. So when you get in your Bible and you start speaking out, you know, all kinds of words of praise and promises and protection, that's not going to come back to you void. It's not going to come back to you empty. That's exactly what God's word says. It says, my word will not come back to me void. My word will not come back to me empty. When is the last time you got in your Bible? And if your Bible was taken away tomorrow, because I am going to tell you this, there's going to be a point in time in the United States where you're not going to be allowed to go to church anymore. They're going to shut those down. They already started. They're, they're just getting started trying to see how, get a feel for how everybody is going to react to it. They did it with COVID. They shut the churches down. They blamed it on COVID, but they are going to shut the churches down. And when they shut the churches down from there, the persecution in the United States is going to get significantly worse than we've ever seen. And at some point, they're going to take your Bible away. Do you know enough scripture that if they took your Bible away, 
you could still use the sword of the spirit, which is, is what the word is. The word is actually uh, part of your daily armor that we're supposed to put on, right? The armor of God that we're supposed to put on daily is in Ephesians. And the sword of the spirit is the only weapon that you have. Everything else is a defense. So what will you fight with if you don't know scripture? Think about it this way. When Jesus, right before he entered his ministry, he was led. Listen to this. He was led by the spirit. After God, the father just said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. So I want you to think about this for a second. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. He is pleased with him. He is happy with his performance on the earth and everything that he is doing for his glory. And then the spirit, the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit leads him into the wilderness where he doesn't eat or drink for 40 days and 40 nights. And then he's tempted by the devil. He's tempted by the devil, right? And the devil offers him all kinds of things. He says, if you're just, if you're hungry, it's really simple. Why don't you just turn one of these stones into bread? Then you could eat. It makes sense, right? If you're hungry and you're the son of God, you might as well eat. And Jesus responds with what? Positive affirmations? No. Something from a self-help book? No. He responds with the word. And he says what? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. But you would think that the devil would stop right there, right? That he would be done with his foolishness, but he wasn't. So he, he took him up. He, he, he took him up to the pinnacle or whatever, the highest point and said, just jump from here for it is written. So keep in mind that the devil knows scripture too. He knows the word. Do you? So he says to him, it is also written that if you, if you just jump from here, because it is also written that the angels will actually lift you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus responds, it is also written that we should not put our God to a foolish test. So you see how he's responding with the word. You think that the devil stopped there? No, he's relentless and he doesn't sleep. The adversary prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So next he says, okay. So he takes him up again to the heights and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world. And he said, all of this could be yours. You could have it all. I'll give it all to you freely if you would just bow down and worship me. And he said, I, he went right back to scripture and he said, it is written that you shall worship the Lord, your God and him only shall you serve. So I want you to keep that in mind. If the devil knows scripture, maybe we should too, huh? Maybe we should know the word enough to combat the lies of the enemy with the word of truth. How are you going to combat a lie from the enemy if you don't know what the truth is? That's how we're easily deceived. Satan is the ultimate deceiver. He is the father of lies. How is his job made so easy? When someone professes to be a Christian, but doesn't spend any time in the word. So Satan can just lie to you all types of ways and you will accept what he said because you don't know what the truth is. It's time to learn the truth today. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way to heaven. 
There is no other name under heaven by which we can be saved. I know everybody likes to say that there are multiple ways to get to heaven. I'm here to tell you today there are not. There is one. There is one. And his name is Jesus Christ. No one gets to the Father except through him. No one. He was given the name above any other name, the name at which every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. And Jesus is coming back. My question to you is, are you ready as a Christian? And a Christian, we, we're, we're not. We're not talking denominations today. When I say Christian. I mean Christ-like, I mean set apart, a consecrated vessel. That's what it means to be set apart. It means you are in the world, but you are not of the world. You are seated with Christ in heavenly places. You have been born again. The old you was nailed to the cross, crucified, and you rose to new life. You didn't rise to new life just because you dipped in a pool. You didn't rise to new life just because you were baptized. I need to make that clear. The baptism is symbolic of the commitment that you are making. The reason why people are baptized, at least I know the reason why I was baptized is because I want to do what my father, what my father in heaven did. If Jesus was baptized, I want to be baptized too. And it's our, it's, it's symbolic of a commitment. I am crucifying the old me. The old me needs to die. The old me dies today when I go down to this water and I'm coming up a new creature. That's the commitment. Because we're told that we need to crucify our flesh, to deny ourselves, pick up our cross and follow him. So yes, salvation is a free gift. Praise the Lord. It didn't cost you anything to be redeemed, which you were when you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and repented of your sin. I'm going to say that again. When you placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you confessed with your mouth and believed in your heart that he is Lord. They that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, but you must repent. And repentance is not an apology. Repentance is not saying, I'm sorry, God. I won't ever do it again. I vow to live better and, and do better. No, that's not what repentance is. Repentance is a complete change of mind. It's where you are actually cut to the heart by your sin. You are actually cut to the heart by your sin. It's when you go from loving your sin, reveling in your sin, celebrating your sin, to being repelled by your sin, repulsed by your sin, disgusted by your sin, and wanting no part of the sin that so easily entangles. That is the transformation. That is how we are transformed by the renewing of our mind. We actually think differently. I'll give you an example. I was convicted by the Holy Spirit in a club on Halloween night wearing a geisha girl, which is basically like a Chinese prostitute costume. I was standing there with a drink in my hand and I heard the Holy Spirit as clear as day say, I don't belong here. And I thought it was my own thought. And I started to look around the room and survey the territory. And all of a sudden, in that moment, I said to myself, I don't belong here. And when I said that, when I came into agreement with the Holy Spirit's conviction, I tried to go back to Egypt. I tried to go back to my old life. I tried to go back to my old friends. I tried to fit in my old circle again. And I could 
not do it. And there was no more quenching the spirit like I used to. I used to just be like, eh, I want to do what I want to do. I actually felt the Holy Spirit. When I was 19, I walked into a church and the Holy Spirit got a hold of me momentarily and my body trembled from head to foot for like a good 15 minutes nonstop. But I wasn't, I wasn't ready to come out of the world yet. Yes, the Lord does give us a, a grace period. I really believe that he gives us a, a grace period. But if we're not producing any fruit, if we're not showing any signs of a transformed or a changed life, that's a problem. That's a concern. I'm just letting you know. Fruitless trees will be cut at the root. We need to take this seriously. Hell was created for the devil and his angels, but it's a real place. I'm here to tell you today that it is a real place. And we should not treat grace or what Jesus Christ did as a common thing. It's far from common. He went through unimaginable suffering. And we don't, we, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll, you'll obey my commands, but we don't obey because the Bible says so. We don't obey because we read it somewhere. We don't obey because we heard it in church. No, we obey out of love and reverence. A reverent, holy fear of God because we recognize who he is, who we are placing our faith and trust in. And love, because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were heathens in the world, harlots in the world, neck deep in filth, Christ died for us. While he was up on that cross saying, forgive them, Father, they know not what they do. That's referencing you and me, I hope you know. That wasn't just for the people of that day. He's saying that today. He's up there in heaven as the, the designated high priest of heaven. Interceding for you and me saying, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. So we're supposed to live consecrated, holy lives. Well, how do we do that? By spending time in the presence of a holy God, a righteous judge who has no sin in him. That's how the Bible says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all other things will be added unto you. Meaning you won't even have to worry about anything else. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Be anxious for nothing. He says, do not fear. Be not discouraged. Just fix your eyes on me. What happened when what happened when Peter took his eyes off Jesus even for a second? When he was walking on the water, he began to sink. Why? Because apart from him, you can't do anything. He said, apart from me, you can bear no fruit at all. And we're supposed to bear fruit worthy of repentance. So my question to you today is, are you bearing fruit worthy of repentance? Have you noticed that your life has, has changed and transformed significantly? That your character has changed and transformed significantly, little by little, from glory to glory, since you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and truly repented? Or have you truly repented? Have you truly repented of your sin? Because grace, it's not a covering so that we can just continue living in wickedness. That's not what it is. I know that's how some people treat it, but that's not what it is. Yes, all have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. 
The Lord looked down on the earth and he said, no one is good. No, not one. All have become corrupt. Their righteousness is as filthy rags. That's why we need Jesus. But do you know him or do you know of him? And there is a difference. Do you know Jesus Christ? Do you have a personal relationship with the Lord or do you know of him? Do you talk to him? Do you cast your cares on him? He says, cast your cares on me. Lay your, lay your burdens down. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you? Is his perfect love casting out all your fear? Because that's what it's intended to do. The more you are filled up with his spirit. And yes, we can be filled up even more with his spirit. How? Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We need to be delivered from certain mindsets. Toxic thought patterns, those are strongholds, mental strongholds. Those need to be broken. There are certain curses that have come upon your life generational ancestral curses that were passed down because of your ancestors rebellion passed down for generations to you those need to be broken and Jesus became the curse to free us from the curse but those actually need to be broken in Jesus name some of you might even need deliverance and not even know it you might even need deliverance from demonic spirits and not even know it. But that's a real thing. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. That's what the Bible says. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and rulers of wickedness in heavenly places. You have an enemy of your soul. He was an enemy of your soul the minute you were born. So I'm sure if you reflect back, you can see where you were attacked early on. Satan knows who you are, even if you don't. He knows who you are. And so God wants us to walk in his will. He wants us to walk in his plan. How can we do that if we are constantly trying to live out our own plans? This is what it means to deny ourselves. And how do we crucify our flesh? Well, number one, if you want to crucify your flesh, you've got to do what your flesh hates. Your flesh hates to read the word. Your flesh hates hates to pray. Your flesh hates to be in the presence of God. Your flesh hates absolutely hates it hates worship hates praise bible studies all of it your flesh hates it you want to crucify your flesh you start doing those things on a regular basis and not just hearing the word but applying it when you learn something new you go out and you look for a way to put it into practice in your day-to-day -day life and that's where you'll see the transformation because we're called to be the salt of the earth. We're called to be cities on a hill. We are glory carriers. The Lord is the light of the world. We bear witness to his light. And because darkness is overtaking the earth and it doesn't take somebody with that good of an eyesight to even see it. a blind man could probably see how darkness is overtaking the earth right now because you could feel the evil. And it's in our face. And it's ever present. And it's taking over. Why? Because Satan is the lowercase g, God of this world, the prince of the power of the air, temporarily. Temporarily. And he knows his time is short, so he's trying to take as many people as he can with him. The Bible says that the road to hell the road to eternal destruction is broad. That means it's wide. There's a lot of people on it. But the road to eternal life is a narrow path. And it's a difficult road. 
and few find it. It's a difficult road. Why? Because you have to throw out your plans. You are not your own. You are bought at a price. You are just a sojourner on this earth. You are passing through. You are on assignment now. Welcome to the Great Commission. That's what it means to be a Christian. We study to show ourselves approved. Not only to study to show ourselves approved so that we, we, can, we can teach and be a part of the Great Commission, but obviously, again, because at some point, they're going to take your Bible away. So you want those laws to be written on the tablet of your heart, literally, that you could just draw from any time. You're going to need it. You're going to need it. And we need to have these discussions because there's, there's some people out there that they claim to be Christian. But again, the Bible says you will know them by their fruit. You can't be Christian and racist. You can't be Christian and hateful. You can't be Christian and step over that, that homeless man or woman without a second thought in the subway. Just walk right over them. No. See, when that circumcision starts to happen in your heart, that heart of stone, he said, I'm going to take your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. A heart of stone that really didn't have much compassion, was more concerned about ourselves than what's going on in the world. And all of a sudden, we have this newfound love for God's people. Not just ourselves, not just our immediate circle and our family and those closest to us. But we have a newfound love for God's people. Why? Because we know what it's like to be a lost and without hope in the world. We know what it's like. And we don't want that for anyone. If the Lord doesn't want a single one of us to perish, then we shouldn't want anybody out there to perish either. This life is hard. And you don't know what somebody has gone through. And some people, when we try to preach them the gospel, they're, they're hearing through ears and eyes of trauma. Some people simply don't want any part of our faith because they grew up in a Christian household that had zero love. A Christian household that was all about traditions, rituals, religion, dead, dry religion, a powerless gospel. A form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. That's the Bible talks about that. But the Bible also says this. You could speak the tongues of angels. But if you have not love, you are nothing more than a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be seen as just nothing but noise when I go out and try to tell somebody about Jesus. I say, Lord, move me out of the way. Get me out of the picture. They're not coming to meet Angela. They're not coming to sit down and interact with me. I want them to interact with the one who gave them life and breath. I want them to interact with the one that loves them more than they could ever love themselves. That's who I want them to meet. So this is just something I, I really want you to think about. Because I know there's a lot of people out there that are claiming to be Christians, but you're doing everything that God hates. You're Christian, but you're, you're practicing witchcraft. Reading horoscopes every day. Did you know that the zodiac signs of the horoscopes, every single one of them is named after a false god and goddess? Did you know that? The Bible says my people perish for lack of knowledge. Did you know that the, the yoga is actually, it's, it's another form of new age witchcraft because during yoga, 
they tell you to empty out your mind. Well, if you're emptying out your mind and you're not being filled with the Holy Spirit, what are you being filled with, number one? And did you know that the majority of yoga poses, if not all of them, are poses towards Hindu gods? And there's literally thousands of them. So every time you stretch in a particular pose, you're actually worshiping a false god. My people perish for lack of knowledge. This is why we need we we need to we need to be in relationship with the Lord because He's going to start showing us some things that we wouldn't otherwise know. He promises to show us great and mighty things that we know not. The Lord actually wants to speak to you. The steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. I don't know about you, but I want my steps ordered. Because when I was in the world and I was trying to make my own decisions and I was trying to lead myself, I ended up flat on my face more than more times than I can count. So I want my steps to be ordered by the Lord. And it says in the Bible, he is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Is he a lamp to your feet and a light to your path? Are you letting the spirit lead you or are you being led by your flesh? Do you make decisions based on your feelings or do you actually take it to God and get a response back? He speaks through his word, but he also speaks in a, a myriad of different ways. He speaks to us through nature. He speaks to us through road signs and license plates. He speaks to us through other people. He speaks to us in a still small voice. But he wants to speak to you. The only thing is our sin separates us from God. That's what makes him seem so far away. And when you quench the spirit enough, he goes silent. What does it mean to quench the spirit? It means you didn't obey that conviction. You felt that tug pulling you in a different direction and you went towards exactly what he was trying to restrain you from. Because at the end of the day, we still have free will. Yes, the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. But then it's up to us to obey those convictions. If we quench the Spirit enough, he goes silent. He goes quiet. I've talked to so many people just recently that said, I feel like, I feel like God isn't there anymore. I can't feel him anymore. He, he used to speak to me. I don't hear him anymore. And I tell them the same thing. And your sin separates you from God. Repentance is not a one and done. We don't just repent and that's the end of it. We, we're constantly repenting. We're constantly repenting. Lord, get this out of me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for being lazy or slothful or, or I'm sorry for being jealous or envious. Pluck this up out of my heart. Get this bitter, defiled root out of me. Burn it out with Holy Ghost fire until there's nothing left. Don't let it come back. Heal me and I will be healed. Lord, save me and I will be saved. So yes, we have to continuously repent because it's a change of mind. You're constantly changing your mind around certain behaviors. And, and how? How do we do that? Well, we continue finding out what the word says. And then we make a commitment. We make a commitment to turn our eyes away from worthless things. We make a commitment to come out from among them. And touch not the filthy things. Jesus sat with sinners. He sat with tax collectors. Matter of fact, the Pharisees and the Sadducees had a fit. Why are you sitting with those people? He sat with them. He talked with them. As should you and I as a Christian, but he did not participate in their wickedness. 
he didn't join them in the things they were doing. That's the difference. We're told to be, be not conformed to the world. That means don't, don't conform yourself to the culture. Don't do what everybody else does. Don't say what everybody else says. We're to stand out for a reason. Because if we don't look any different from the culture and society and the world, they're going to say, why, why do I want what you have? It doesn't look any different from what I've got. But when they, when they see the joy of the Lord, which is your strength, all over your face, your face is just radiant with joy. And they know that the situation that you're in is not a, a joyous one. Or they know something you're going through and they can't understand. How is it that she's still smiling? How is it that he's, he's so happy? That's when they become curious about the God you know. Amen. I hope this was a blessing to somebody today. I hope that you all are well. I love every single one of you. Um, when I come on here and I and I do these words, it's it's out of love. It's out of love. I don't claim to be perfect by any means, but I'm growing in the Lord. And that's what I want for all of you. I want you to grow in the Lord. I don't want you to be a fruitless tree. I want you to bear fruit worthy of repentance. I want you to go from glory to glory. I want you to be able to hear from the Lord. Amen. And so that's that's why I'm, I'm coming on here today to share all of this with you. So I love you all. Um, I pray you are well. Let me know if you have any prayer requests. Um, you can either put them in the um, in the replies and responses or you can send me an email. All right. God bless.